this camera. <laughs> Yeah, those don't do well with moving shots. <laughs> I guess it's still. Thank you. Same thing I'm saying.
do it. Fairfax County. <coughs> oh, I live right in Burke, right next to it. Do you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Block of 123 and half a mile from Burke Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Area. I live. Little Locks Road. I live in the old Burke Center part near the uh, VR station. Okay. Take that VR. Oh, that's uh, one of the reasons. It's a wonderful thing. It's a Two mm. blocks. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I. If I can make it to the VRA station, even in a worse storm, I can always get to work. Hmm. Well, they put up a massive uh, parking garage. Oh, now. it's great. Oh, it's yeah. that's fantastic. Margie Graves. I'm in your district. Oh, wonderful. Where do you station. It's a stitch one. Easy questions for me. Sam Chon from EDS, also a constituent. <laughs> they should both go for it. <laughs> I'm very sure. It's a pleasure. How are you doing today? How are you, I'm not a constituent, but I still live in London. Say hurry up. Yeah. Sum up. <laughs> <laughs>
Is that right? Simply for compression of record. Yeah. It's not normal. Hmm. Maybe it's C SPAN. <laughs> One of the five C SPANs? With, the, with their never ending source yeah. of entertainment. C SPAN Ocho, yeah. C SPAN 8. <laughs> C-SPAN tech to yeah. bore the world. Okay. Can we move it up, if, uh, or is it staged? You can move it. Okay. Oh, okay. It seems pretty sensitive. It's, I can hear our voices. Saving the best for last. I appreciate that. Saying anything provocative? Not in the least. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's mostly uh, got a recommendation based on a successful program that's been implemented at DOD. What's that? Defense Industrial? Um, the Directive 8570. Oh, yeah. Which is on training and certification. I mean, that that's been a real. No, for you guys, yeah, because it's right there. I A T I M one two three. Boom. Yeah. It's a, a distinguished, uh, a defined um, career line. Actually, yeah. we've referenced that in a written testimony. Mm. I'm not sure if I referenced I T A, but I definitely talked about it when I wrote. Yeah. That. Yeah. Oh, it, would, it would be nice to see. I mean, my concern is what happens at this level. How does it play out down to the business community? Because there's a real risk right now with what's going on with some of the states where you know, we could, in theory, wind up with 51 different sets of standards for information security. And while at the, you know, at the government level, even to some extent for the large enterprises, but I think anything below the very largest of enterprise organizations, it's going to create a substantial burden if we don't create some standards through the work that's going on at this level. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I uh, distilled down to what I was. Secure must be trained by the industry certified by security mm -hmm. technology practices. Uh, I talked about it a little bit more in the written testimony, but mm -hmm. no, I agree with 85701 is actually very good for the defense mm -hmm. department. Mm -hmm. Well, anytime, you know, I, I think the key with any of this stuff is if they, if they can if they can effectively rely on industry standards and best practices and the training and certifications that are put in with some refinement, you know, as, as one would expect, 
that'll create a system that will not be cumbersome to replicate. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm from New Hampshire, and we're dealing with the ramifications of what the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is doing with their information privacy regulations, and it's creating some significant burdens. Um, not difficult to address in the grand scheme of things, but if that starts to roll out across the country, and if you do business in Massachusetts and Colorado, and you've got to invest, you know, in theory, some, some fairly sizable sums of money and, and resource to address both, pretty soon you're going to limit your market opportunities based on how many states you have to comply to. I think what they do here with FISMA and what, and what may be happening on the Senate side with the Rockefeller Snow um, cybersecurity legislation could really set an effective framework by which this could be addressed from the public sector all the way down to the private sector. Maybe this was called for 9.30 and not 9. There was some confusion about that. 9. No, 9. Okay. George Staff. Well, and there's the chairwoman. The Subcommittee on Management, Organization, and Procurement of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will now come to order. And welcome. Today's hearing will review the Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002, or FISMA, and agency efforts to improve the security, integrity, and reliability of federal government information systems. In addition, the hearing will
wish all of you a good morning uh, and welcome to today's subcommittee hearing on federal information security and review of agency efforts to comply with the Federal Information Security Management Act. And I welcome our distinguished witnesses and look forward to hearing your testimony. Since FISMA was enacted in 2002, the federal government has made significant progress in securing its key networks and information technology assets. That said, FISMA only tells a portion of the story as if we're only required to read one chapter of a book. Although FISMA does provide a good snapshot to how agencies are covering their information security basics, it does nothing to tell us about the current vulnerability landscape or how the cyber threat matrix is changing. If FISMA is to become a more useful tool for countering cyber threats, it must require agencies to utilize better testing, monitoring, and performance measures for determining what our true cybersecurity posture is. According to the GAO, 20 out of 24 agencies have been identified as having either material weaknesses or material deficiencies in their information security controls. In other <coughs> words, these agencies are lacking key controls that are necessary for maintaining a sound security program. The failure to establish these controls The failure to establish these controls leave agencies vulnerable to significant data breaches and disruptions to key critical infrastructures and potential compromises of our national security. These weaknesses are widespread within key programs of both the Department of Transportation and the Department of Homeland Security and must be remedied in order to ensure the proper functioning of our government's IT assets. Today I'm hoping our agency witnesses will tell us what changes are underway to remedy the problems identified through the work of GAO and the IG community. Furthermore, I want our new federal CEO, Mr. Kundra, to tell us what this plan or what his plan objectives are for strengthening FISMA and how the soon-to-be-released 60-day White House Cyber Review will impact the use <coughs> or relevance of FISMA going forward. Lastly, I'd like to hear our panelists' specific recommendations for legislation to develop a harmonized framework for organizing and for coordinating government-wide information security policies and practices. Once again, I'd like to thank our panel for joining us today and look forward to their testimony. Okay. Now the ranking member, Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate this, uh, this hearing. And uh, let me just, first of all, ask that my written statement be entered into the record. Without objection. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't <laughs> let me let me say that sincerely, uh, one of the biggest concerns I have, uh, obviously coming from San Diego, where uh, information services are, I'm going to crank up this. Uh, in my you can do it. Only in Washington, D. Open my up. Uh, <laughs> turn it off. Turn it okay. Up. It doesn't light up. Yeah, it doesn't light up at all. Is it on? Let's see. Well, let's push it again. It's not, it's not here. We'll share. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me let me just say that um, one of my biggest concerns after being briefed by a lot of my experts in San Diego, which is a bit of a hotbed of information services, as everybody knows, the uh, site of Qualcomm and many other uh, uh, secretly uh, hiding away high-tech firms. But this is really an underestimated threat to our national security in a lot of ways. And it's not just within our military. Um, it's not just within our own government operations. It's nationally. 
Um, and um, every private sector, every public sector has this threat hanging over our heads. And I think one thing we learned from 9-11 is um, the uh, good old <clears throat> comment that we didn't know or your, um, we didn't think we needed to do that much um, is not acceptable anymore. And frankly, if we can't maintain some kind of security over our systems at the federal government, um, we're going to be hard pressed to try to figure out how to coordinate the private sector and even ask the private sector to do more when it appears that out of 23, I mean 24 um, major departments, we have 23 that have found deficiencies. Uh, I just think the challenge here is for us to lead through example and um, really try to get down to um, the root cause of these deficiencies and how we can modify our operations to avoid them in the future. And maybe, just maybe, we can do something that is never done very much in this town, and that is lead through example for the private sector and show them how to address this, this uh, challenge. So I look forward to the hearing. I look forward to the opportunities to uh, dialogue with the witnesses and with fellow uh, members of this committee, because I think it's something that we're going to have to spend a lot more time and effort addressing um, to make sure that we don't live to see the day that there is a 9-11 with a cyber version of 9-11 somewhere over the horizon. And thank you very much for the hearing again. I now yield to Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and I want to welcome our panelists here this morning and thank you for holding this kind of hearing. Uh, I think we want to welcome Ms. Graves and Mr. Sundor, our constituents of mine. I uh, expect this panel to be very respectful. Uh, Ms. Graves. Uh, our recent, uh, this, this hearing uh, complements the recent hearing we had on cyber security. It's an exciting time to be pursuing the reforms of federal information security programs. With Anish Chopra as our new uh, CTO, and I believe he's had a chance today, and Vivek Kundra as our newly appointed uh, CIO, we have extraordinary talent and expertise at the executive level. First, we should acknowledge the many federal employees who've done such a good job of implementing federal information Security Management Act of 2002. Since 2005, most federal agencies have significantly improved implementation of contingency plans and completed their disclosures. In the last seven years, we have made significant progress even as information security federal firms. However, there is obviously still room for improvement, as you and the ranking member both indicated. For example, the number of employees receiving specialized security training actually declined from between fiscal year 2007 and fiscal year 2008. The GAO report also notes that FISMA requires security awareness training for contractors as well as agency personnel. At our May 5th hearing on cybersecurity, we learned that many security breaches occurred through contract and information systems. Perhaps metrics should take breaches into account. Since more than 90% of personnel and contractors are receiving security awareness training, perhaps the effectiveness and frequency of that training needs to be reexamined. In the prepared testimony for today, both CIO Vivek Kundra and EDS employee Samuel Chen note that some agencies may be more focused on compliance with FISMA than performance of their security systems. Moreover, they note that reporting requirements of FISMA could be too much. I look forward to learning more about how FISMA could be reformed to emphasize performance and minimize unnecessary paperwork. Again, thank you, uh, Chairman Watson, for holding this hearing. I appreciate your work. This subcommittee is conducting the enhanced. Well, thank you uh, <coughs> very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Well, I pushed this button down. I don't. Yeah, know. I know we're having trouble. We sent for someone. Well, we're Take a look. <laughs> <laughs> I think his voice is strong. Well, <laughs> I don't really have a formal uh, statement anyway. But I do thank you for calling this hearing. I do sometimes wonder if, if true cyber security is possible. I remember several years ago coming back from lunch in my district one time and I heard on the CBS national radio news that computer hackers had gotten into the top secret files at the Pentagon hundreds of times. Some report had just come out. And then I remember reading a few years ago a front page story in the Washington Post where a 12 year old boy in California had opened the floodgates at the Hoover Dam. Um, um, a great distance away, hundreds of miles away by uh, hacking into the system. And so uh, I don't know, it seems to me that, that uh, 
uh, you know, may possibly we started out controlling the computers and now they uh, control us, I suppose. And, and uh, uh, you know, everybody, or especially the young people, worship the um, technology today and are addicted to it. But uh, uh, it, it, it seems to me that um, uh, this, this is a serious problem. We've almost done away with uh, any type of privacy or secrecy in this country because it, se it seems that um, uh, anybody can find out anything that they want to, and that, that includes uh, people who wish to do us harm from other countries. So this is a serious problem. I am a little skeptical as to whether we can actually uh, uh, do what needs to be done, but I, th I do think it's good that you called this hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there's no further testimony. Uh, I'd like now to go to the panelists, and would you all stand, please? It's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. And I'd like to ask all of you to stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. <coughs> I'd like to now introduce the panelists. First, we have uh, Vivek Kundra, the Chief Information Office Officer at the Office of Management and Budget. And Mr. Kundra was appointed as the first federal CEO of the United States by President Obama in March of 2009. In this capacity, he directs the policy and strategic planning of federal information technology investments and is responsible for oversight of federal technological spending. Prior to joining the Obama administration, Mr. Kundra served in Mayor Fenty's cabinet as the chief technology officer for the District of Columbia and Governor Kane's cabinet as assistant secretary of commerce and technology for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, Mr. Gregory Walshusen serves as a director of information security issues at GAO. His work involves examining federal information security practices and trends at federal agencies. And he is GAO's leading expert on FISMA implementation. Uh, Mr. Ja uh, Ms. Jacqueline Patilio is the Acting Chief Information Officer at the Department of Transportation. And as DOT, at DOT, Ms. Patilio serves as the Principal Advisor to the Department CIO on matters involving information resources and information services management. Prior to her current role, Ms. Patilio served as the Deputy CIO for DOT and as Chief Information Officer at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Ms. Margaret Graves is the Acting Chief Information Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. There she oversees IT portfolio or of $5.4 billion in programs, as well as the operations of the Office of the Chief Information Officer, which covers the financial or functional areas of applied technology, uh, enterprise architecture, data manager, IT security, infrastructure operations, IT accessibility, budget, and acquisition. <coughs> Mr. Samuel Chung is a director for the cybersecurity practice for the U.S. public sector and EDS, at EDS, a division of uh, Hiller Packard. And there he is responsible for the strategy, portfolio development, and industry messaging of all cybersecurity solutions for EDS US public sector clients. And uh, Mr. MJ Shore, is that correct? That is correct. Is the president of Generally Technology Group Incorporated and here today on behalf of the Computing Technology Industry Association. Founded by Mr. Shore in 1997, the Generally Technology Group's 
provides outsourced IT services to small business throughout New Hampshire. I also like to recognize his daughter, Hannah, who traveled with him today's hearing. <laughs> Hannah? <laughs> okay, welcome. <laughs> I'd like to say again, welcome to all of you. And I ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony. And uh, to keep this summary under five minutes, if possible, and your, completely, uh, your complete statement will be included in the hearing record. And uh, Mr. Kunder, would you please proceed? Good morning, Chairwoman uh, Watson, Ranking Member Bilbray, uh, Congressman Connolly, and Congressman Duncan. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the state of federal information security. The security of federal information systems is a major concern for this administration. Our nation's security and economic prosperity depend on the stability and integrity of our federal communication systems and infrastructure. Safeguarding these important interests will require a balanced decision-making process that integrates and harmonizes our national and economic security objectives with our privacy rights, civil liberties, and open government. As the first step, the President has directed a 60-day review of cybersecurity policies and efforts throughout the federal government. OMB is working closely along with other agencies with Acting Senior Director Melissa Hathaway of the National Security Council and her team on this review. During the last several decades, the United States and the world have been moving from a paper-based world to a digital world. Advances in technology are fundamentally changing the way business is done, increasing productivity and providing the American people easy access to services that previously were structurally impossible to deliver electronically. Essential to these new capabilities is the presence of communications networks that securely carry sensitive information. Yet, as we have unleashed new transactions over this network, a new class of risks has emerged. The American people need to trust that the, in, that the information they're submitting to or receiving from the government is accurate, reliable, and secure. However, recent security breaches at the Federal Aviation Administration and the vendor that hosts USAJobs.gov demonstrates that the current federal information security posture is not what the American people have a right to expect. The Federal Information Security Management Act has been in place for seven years. It has raised the level of awareness in agencies and in the country at large, but we're not where we need to be. In our initial review of, the information, secu of information security, the following things have surfaced. One, the performance, um, information, the performance information currently collected under FISMA does not reflect the security posture of federal agencies. Two, the processes used to collect the information is cumbersome, labor intensive, and take away time for a meaningful analysis. And three, the federal community is focused too much on compliance and not enough on outcomes. While the current reporting metrics have made sense, may have made sense when FISMA was enacted, they're largely compliance-based. They're trailing rather than leading indicators. We need metrics that give us insight into agency security postures and possible vulnerabilities on an ongoing basis. To evaluate new metrics, we're taking a collaborative approach. We're working with the community of federal agency chief information officers, chief information security officers, the inspector generals, and the National Institutes of Standards and Technology to consider more effective security measures ones that show us the current status and are predictive in nature. In addition, we're reaching out to a broad array of organizations across the public and private sector and academia. Today, agencies and IGs are heavily focused on compliance. The creation of a secure, transparent, collaborative environment requires a risk-based approach. <coughs> we will never achieve our security goals through compliance alone, because security threats are fluid and <coughs> constantly changing. Each new technology, new employee, and new program represents potential for additional security weaknesses. 
agencies need to adopt a risk-based approach to security to look at activities, people, and programs on an ongoing basis. The administration is committed to creating a trusted, secure uh, federal computing environment that makes information transparent to the American people while protecting privacy and confidentiality. While the actions I've spoken about here will assist in creating the environment, they alone are not enough. A secure, trusted computing environment in the federal government is a responsibility of everyone involved, from agency heads to those charged with oversight. It entails employees, contractors, and the American people working together to create a culture of vigilance around security that enable us to continually and efficiently leverage the power of technology. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this very important issue, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kundra. Um, Kundra, excuse me. Mr. Bill Holson, you may proceed. Good morning, Chairman Watts, Chairwoman Watson, Ranking Member Bill Bray, <coughs> and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing on the state of federal information security. Information security is a critical consideration for any organization that depends on computerized systems and networks to carry out its mission or business. It is especially important for federal agencies where maintaining the public trust is essential. Without proper safeguards, federal systems and networks are vulnerable to intrusions uh, by individuals and groups with malicious intent who could potentially obtain and manipulate sensitive data, commit fraud, disrupt operations, and launch attacks against other computer systems. The Federal Information Security Management Act, or FISMA, was enacted in part to provide a comprehensive framework for ensuring the effectiveness of information security controls over information resources that support the federal operations and assets. Madam Chairwoman, two weeks ago, I testified before you and this subcommittee about the growing and evolving nature of the th cyber threats, vulnerabilities, and the uh, challenges that place federal systems and operations at risk. Today, I will discuss agencies' progress in performing key information security control activities, the effectiveness of information security at federal agencies, and opportunities to bolster security. In fiscal year 2008, federal government reported improved information security performance relative to most of the key performance metrics established by OMB. Although the percentage of employees with significant security responsibilities who receive specialized training decreased significantly, increases were reported in the number of employees and contractors who received security awareness training, the percentage of systems with tested contingency plans, and the percentage of systems that were certified and accredited. Despite reported progress, major federal agencies continue to experience significant control deficiencies. Most agencies did not implement controls to sufficiently pre prevent, limit, or detect access to computer networks, systems, or information. Moreover, agencies did not always configure networks devices and services to prevent unauthorized access and ensure system integrity, patch key servers and workstations in a timely manner, and maintain complete continuity of operations plans for key information <coughs> systems. An underlying cause for these weaknesses is that most agencies have not fully or effectively implemented elements of the agency-wide information security programs mandated by FISMA. These factors continue to place federal assets at risk of inadvertent or deliberate misuse, financial information at risk of unauthorized modification or destruction, sensitive information at inappropriate risk uh, of inappropriate disclosure, and critical operations at risk of disruption. Accordingly, GAO has again designated federal information security as a government-wide high-risk area in its 2009 high-risk report to the Congress. Nevertheless, opportunities exist to bolster federal information security. Federal agencies could implement the hundreds of recommendations made by GAO and agency IGs to resolve previously reported control deficiencies and information security program shortfalls. In addition, the White House, OMB, and other federal agencies 
have continued or launched several government-wide initiatives that, have in, that are intended to improve information security over systems and information. For example, in January 2008, the White House launched a series of initiatives collectively known as the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative aimed primarily at improving the Department of Homeland Security and other federal agencies' efforts to protect against intrusion attempts and anticipate future threats. In summary, although federal agencies report performing con key control activities for an increasing percentage of their systems, persistent weaknesses in agency information security continue to threaten the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of federal systems and information. To help address these and other challenges, sustain commitment, effective oversight, and improvements to the national cybersecurity strategy are needed to strengthen federal information security. Chairwoman Watson, this concludes uh, my opening statement, and I'd be happy to answer your questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, time. Mr. Wilchuson and uh, Ms. Patillo. You may proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman Watson and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the state of federal information security and the Department of Transportation's efforts to comply with the Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002. I currently serve as the department's acting chief information officer and acting senior agency official for privacy. The Department of Transportation Office of the Chief Information Officer has operational responsibility for the departmental network and communications infrastructure, as well as providing shared services for the Office of the Secretary and for an increasing share of employees in the DOT operating administrations as they transition towards use of DOT shared information services. The DOT CIO's office also has overall responsibility for the department's FISMA program and the cybersecurity posture of DOT networks and information systems. As part of those responsibilities, we must maintain situational awareness of the vulnerabilities and activities on DOT networks and systems, but also seek to mitigate identified vulnerabilities prior to exploitation in order to minimize risks to DOT, federal, and to the extent practicable, private systems and data. Today's world of, today's world of rapidly evolving threats, interconnected systems, and telework vulnerabilities and risks have the potential to impact upon the other networks and interconnected systems. DOT is currently working to make improvements from its 2007 FISMA grade and the DOT Inspector General's 2008 evaluation of the DOT cybersecurity program as not effective. We developed an aggressive correction action plan to address the recommendations made by the Inspector General. Instituted regular internal coordination with the DOT operating administrations to monitor and drive progress, as well as reallocating existing personnel and resources to focus on key areas for improvement, such as certification and accreditation, verification and validation, and awareness training. As DOT continues to make improvements in cybersecurity and privacy, we know much remains to be done. Partnerships between the public and private sector to develop more intuitive and proactive mechanisms for dynamic prevention and detection of harmful behavior will facilitate a paradigm shift from a reactive mode to a more dynamic and proactive mode. In conclusion, I would offer that the Department of Transportation has achieved considerable progress in securing its networks against intrusions and cyber attacks. Nonetheless, there's no reason to celebrate, nor time to rest. Again, 
thank you for the opportunity to comment on these important topics, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Patillo. Ms. Graves, you may proceed. Chairwoman Watson, Ranking Member Bill Bray, and members of the subcommittee, thank you and good morning. I'm Margie Graves, the Acting CIO for DHS. Today I will discuss the state of information security at the Department of Homeland Security and our efforts to comply with the requirements established under the Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002. In 2004, the Department of Homeland Security embarked on a multi-year strategy for bringing the department into full FISMA compliance. In the ensuing two years, the department conducted an enterprise-wide IT systems inventory and ensured that all systems completed a full risk assessment and a comprehensive certification and accreditation. Security requirements have also been built into the department's systems engineering lifecycle methodology and specific contract language in the Homeland Security Acquisition Regulation now expressly requires contractors to comply with applicable department security policies. In 2007, the department's Enterprise IT Security Operations Center was chartered to provide a 24 by 7 computer incident handling capability for the department. The original focus was to mitigate the effects of standard viruses, worms, and other forms of malicious payloads that do not directly target any specific agency or group. But by late 2007, it had also become apparent that in addition to these nonspecific threats, there was a growing class of sophisticated actors who directly target the department and especially our leadership. To address these threats, the department created its own internal focused operations team to better understand enterprise risk associated with targeted attacks and to develop and deploy response capabilities to deter them. In addition to our full commitment to implementing all federal IT security initiatives, DHS is now pursuing several enterprise consolidation and enhancement efforts as part of an overall defense in depth strategy to better confront these threats. All of these initiatives are supported in the President's fiscal year 2010 budget that was recently submitted to Congress for approval. Specific initiatives include the following. First, the Department is committed to fully implementing all requirements of the Homeland Security Presidential Directive 12, including logical access for IT systems. Second, the OneNet project is a major department initiative for collapsing legacy wide area networks into one enterprise network. The department is transitioning all components into mission unique trust zones through the implementation of a series of policy enforcement points beginning in 2010. Third, we are adding features to the trusted internet connections that will allow us to further improve our ability to detect and respond to malicious emails. Finally, the department's data center consolidation project provides the plan for migrating DHS systems to two enterprise data centers that are currently protected by our trusted internet connections and that have been designed to address sophisticated threats. These two data centers now deliver utility computing and infrastructure as a service, allowing DHS to realize benefits of cloud computing while also providing the security so necessary for the threats we face today. I would also like to acknowledge the great work that the United States Computer Emergency Readiness Team, or U.S. CERT, is doing on behalf of federal agencies. U.S. CERT is deploying government-specific sensors called Einstein that are designed to provide alerts regarding sophisticated actors who directly target the federal government. Einstein sensors are now deployed at both the department's trusted internet connections, and they are providing critical alerts to the focused operations team. As a result of the original FISMA statute, federal agencies now have a good roadmap for designing and implementing agency-wide information security programs. The statute provides a strong foundation on which to build. However, we've seen over the last few years that sophisticated threat actors are becoming more persistent and more aggressive. Therefore, each and every agency must also develop in-house focused operations capability to improve overall situational awareness about these sophisticated actors and to be ready to respond effectively whenever there is any indication of a targeted attack. The department welcomes the opportunity to work with Congress in developing any future strategy and will not only build on past successes but will also that will also remain relevant and effective in today's evolving IT security threat environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Graves. Mr. John, you may proceed. Good morning, Chairwoman Watson and distinguished members of the subcommittee. 
on behalf of EDS and HP Company, thank you for the opportunity to discuss our perspectives on this important topic of federal information security. For nearly 45 years, EDS has been a trusted ally serving governments across the world. As one of the largest providers of technology services and solutions to the U.S. government, we strive daily to achieve secure operational excellence in everything we do. From the millions of warfighters that carry our identity credentials to the one in five citizens who used our voter registration and election management systems last fall, we are entrusted with some of the most sensitive information of our fellow citizens. We understand and appreciate the enormous security challenges that our government agencies face today. We can attest definitively to the fact that the well-publicized threats facing our information infrastructures are real. Since our founding, we have built and managed on behalf of our government customers some of the largest and most complex systems and networks in existence. This includes the Navy Marine Corps Internet, which is the largest purpose-built network in, in the world. We currently manage 180 data centers, 380,000 servers, 5.4 million desktops, and nearly 15 million Internet IP addresses. And we, like everyone else, are constantly under attack. We're also finding the number, type, and sophistication of attacks to be growing, and we expect these trends to continue. FISMA was enacted nearly seven years ago to require federal agencies to improve the security postures of their information systems by implementing a program that would reduce security risks. While the debate rages as to whether FISMA is an effective engine for measuring and improving security performance, there is little doubt to its good intentions. While there are numerous positive benefits provided by FISMA, there is general consensus that FISMA does in fact need reform. We observed and participated in many passionate debates about the effectiveness of FISMA and have concluded that the following deficiencies need to be addressed. First, compliance has become too administrative, emphasizing paperwork. Second, the correlation between compliance and operating performance is unclear. Three, accountability for good and poor compliance is also unclear. Four, the validity of what is being measured under FISMA is in question. And five, rapidly emerging threats may be outpacing, outpacing compliance efforts. Our vision for information security for our customers is simple. Security should be so tightly integrated into the core of agency operations that stakeholders have the confidence to be agile at the edge. To put it simply, security should be an embedded part of operations that permeates across the enterprise. By no means do we think this will be an easy or short journey. In fact, we expect this vision will include difficult decisions and foundational changes that will require champions, resources, technologies, and definitely the wisdom of time. That said, I think we would be remiss if we were not to discuss the first steps and big challenges that must be addressed to take the first positive steps toward our vision. First, governance. Because the threats against our information systems and our infrastructures can appear without warning, and the defense cycles required could be in seconds, lawful orders that change an agency's infrastructure must be carried out quickly, quickly and comprehensively across the government enterprise. This highlights the need for clear and consistent roles, responsibilities, policies, and accountability structures for the government enterprise. Second, consolidation. Consolidating and standardizing infrastructures facilitates situational awareness, nearly impossible when agencies depend on a myriad of small, independently operating networks and enclaves. Three, consistent protection. Because government infrastructures are vast and interconnected, apply, are interconnected applying consistent enterprise-wide defense and depth strategies strongly improves security performance. Four, emphasis on operating performance. We support the efforts to clearly articulate the required operating thresholds for security and acquisitions to better meet them. And finally, people. Security practitioners clearly must be trained, vetted, and industry certified on the best security policies, technologies, and practices. We need to continue the trend of raising a much larger cybersecurity workforce. In summary, we, we believe information security must be tightly integrated with operations of an agency. It will take a conscious effort by operators and users, government and industry alike, for the embedding of security into everything we do. For nearly 50 years, EDS has been an ally for governments in tackling some of the most difficult challenges that face them. And we, look, and we continue to stand by to ready to work with you on this one. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Good morning, Chairman Watson, Chairwoman Watson, Ranking Member Bilbray, Congressman Connolly, and hopefully Congressman Duncan as well. Uh, Chairwoman Watson, I want to thank you for your acknowledgement of my daughter. Uh, I appreciate that. I wanted her to have the opportunity to see our participatory government working quite well. And Ranking Member Bilbray, I think you will find that my testimony will address some of the concerns that you articulated quite directly. 
On behalf of the Computing Technology Industry Association, CompTIA, we thank you for your ongoing interest in the state of federal information security. This is a broad yet critical subject ranging from FISMA, as well as a variety of practices that impact our national security, citizenry, and the computing industry at large. We appreciate the opportunity to share with you the following views. CompTIA is the voice of the $3 trillion information technology industry. CompTIA's members include thousands of small businesses called value-added resellers, commonly referred to as VARs, as well as nearly every major computer hardware manufacturer, software publisher, and services provider. Based upon a recent CompTIA survey, we estimate that 1 in 12, or about 12 million American adults, consider themselves to be an IT worker. This is larger than the number of American adults classified by the BLS as employed in farming, mining, and construction combined. This is also close to the number of adults classified by BLS as working in manufacturing or transportation. CompTIA has concluded that the IT workforce is now one of the largest and most important parts of the American political community. My name is MJ Shore. I am the President and Virtual Chief Technology Officer of Avar, Genelee Technology Group, and I am pleased to be testifying on behalf of CompTIA. I live in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and have been an information technology entrepreneur. In 1997, I founded Genelee and have since served as its President. On behalf of CompTIA and its many small business member companies, we welcome the subcommittee's exploration of FISMA and its effectiveness for today's ever-increasing cybersecurity challenges. Certainly many critics and the other witnesses, including the GAO, have commented on the effectiveness <coughs> excuse me, of FISMA. Recently, the GAO submitted 12 recommendations to the House of Representatives. One finding in particular, the 11th, is significant for your attention. The finding calls for increasing the cadre of cybersecurity professionals, and the report states the following. Expert panel members stated that actions should include making the cybersecurity discipline a profession through testing and licensing. In summary of my written testimony, the issue before us all is how to enhance the security of critical federal systems and protect our country and its citizenry. It is evident to critics or anyone who regularly reads the newspaper that the current awareness training model is not working. Security breaches among the agencies have increased instead of falling off. This may be due to a disturbing phenomenon, namely the lack of adequate personnel training and testing. In contrast, I fear that all too often the answer is a tendency to invest in technological solutions alone. Certainly firewalls and encryption are part of the solution. However, the real cybersecurity equation lies in managing the balance between technology and human capital through training, testing, and certification. It is unfortunate we have so many challenges today because the Congress came very close to requiring certification of federal IT security workers in 2002. FISMA itself only requires security awareness training to inform impacted personnel of information security risks associated with their activities and to comply with agency procedures. The undisputed evidence concerning breaches reveal that this is insufficient for the federal government's needs. In my view, I agree with the critics about several key flaws with the current FISMA framework. First, the fundamental flaw of the, FISMA, of the FISMA framework and the federal government's policy is a lack of emphasis on the training and testing that is vital. My recent meetings with various Hill staff confirms this after my hearing episode after episode about breaches in the federal system caused by human error. For example, the removal of a laptop from a federal site and then improperly securing it while outside that site. A second and significant flaw is the lack of uniform verifiable IT training, IT security training, excuse me, as the single largest problem regarding information security in the federal government. Fortunately, a solution to FISMA's flaws may be found elsewhere in the federal system. In 2004, the Department of Defense has raised the bar for cybersecurity through a training and testing program commonly known as the 8570 Directive. This initiative focuses on the certification of personnel. Based upon my own experience in this industry, I believe that accreditations and certifications offer many benefits, including lower transaction costs. Remarkably, throughout the federal government, only the DOD has formally required its employees and contractors to get certified. Last year, my own IT business, Generally Technology Group, became the first in the country to be accredited for best practices in information security as it relates to our clients. In conclusion, it is undisputed that we must protect the American public by having a security framework that guards information systems for both our federal critical systems as well as the private sector. The computing industry is hard at work facing the unprecedented challenges of securing our data from both malicious threats and human error. Congress enactment of FISMA has provided a base level of protection. The key to securing our federal IT systems for the future lies in the partnership between technology and human capital. 
by effectively managing both technology and the people in concert through training and testing, such as through the certification process, we can win the battles in the security war. The current Defense Department model surrounding the 8570 directive is a model worthy for emulation throughout the federal government. Any modification of FISMA must recognize the lessons surrounding the human capital contribution to the IT security equation by the certification and accreditations to enhance our security. Thank you very much, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shore, and thank all of the uh, witnesses today. We are now going to move to the question period and proceed under the five-minute rule. And um, I will open up the questioning. And uh, I would like to start with uh, Mr. Kundra. Uh, your testimony specifically performance information to determine the government's information security posture. So please uh, cite for us what types of information it doesn't have and how FISMA needs to be more reflective for uh, their compliance requirements. Would you sure. provide so, us with that information? So part of the debate here is as um, more and more transactions have moved to the digital world, um, if you look at legislation in general or standards overall, the challenge is keeping up with the evolving threat. Uh, because what ends up happening is when you set uh, X number of standards uh, in terms of making sure reports are filed, whether that's annually or on, on a quarterly basis, it doesn't necessarily reflect uh, your security posture. An example would be within an agency uh, the, the, the old model used to be that you would build perimeter security in terms of firewalls because most threats were seen as you had an enterprise and you had uh, malicious actors on the outside that were trying to penetrate the defenses that you'd put in. So essentially building walls around the agency. But the, unfortunately, the malicious actors become more and more uh, sophisticated in terms of being able to penetrate much deeper into the, the security systems. So now being able to look at specific data elements uh, and looking at the data itself, and you have this evolution, this race, towards where you have actors that are actually going out there and making sure that they're able to bring down defenses, whether they be firewall, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems. And what we need to do is we need to be able to, as a federal government, monitor agencies more on a real-time basis rather than uh, on an annual or quarterly basis. We no longer can use a model uh, that may have uh, succeeded in an industrial era and apply it to the information age because we're moving towards a real-time model where transactions and billions of dollars and information is moving <coughs> on a real-time basis. And therefore, we have to ensure that the metrics we're looking at uh, move us in that direction. Thank you. As part of its uh, FY2010 proposal, the Obama administration is proposing to expand the use of its IT services, such as cloud computing and other types of data warehousing software platforms for managing agency data and systems. So uh, I have a couple of questions on this. Uh, what are the policies and protocols in place to ensure that the service providers and vendors are meeting information security and privacy standards set under FISMA and the Privacy Act? Sure, so part of uh, what we're making sure with the Federal CIO Council is actually to, to ensure that uh, FISMA is applied uh, to any solutions when it comes to cloud computing. Secondly, uh, from a philosophical perspective, what we need to make sure is that security is actually baked into the very architectures uh, of any solution, whether that's from a technical perspective or whether that's from a cultural or human capital perspective, is that as uh, shifts move in the industry towards cloud computing, it's not only important to bake security into the architecture, but also from a privacy perspective, uh, the CIO Council has a privacy committee that looks at these issues 
and in conversations that we're having with industry, we're making sure that privacy issues and security issues that are at the forefront and that they're also baked in early into the procurement cycle rather than afterwards, after you've procured a system, and then you've got to go back and figure out what you need to do in terms of security. Is it fair to say that the companies providing these services to agencies ought to be responsible for providing at least the same information security uh, protections that would be required of agencies who manage their data in-house? So I think what we need to, to make sure is that uh, we, looked at, we look at it from a risk-based approach, which is uh, there isn't going to be one model that applies to everything. And so there's classes of risks, and what I mean by that is there's a set of services that the federal government has, which is public information, for example, uh, that's not sensitive in nature. So what you want to make sure is that you don't drive up the cost significantly for services that are not sensitive in nature and it's informational versus having information that's either classified or sensitive in nature where you need to ensure that the contractors or any company providing those services have baked in security. And our view would be FISMA should be, you know, as we look at uh, standards and as we, as we look at technology, it shouldn't be seen as just uh, the, the <coughs> ceiling. It should be seen as, a, as the floor but baking even more security depending on what the threat matrix is. Does anyone else, uh, DOT, DHS, uh, want to respond? Uh, if I may, um, Madam Chairwoman, um, a couple points I'd just like to point out. With services such as cloud uh, computing or software as a service, it is, as Mr. Kundra mentioned, very important that the contractors and the organizations providing those services have adequate security mechanisms in place to provide the same level of security as needed and, and as required by federal policy since this is federal information that's at risk. One of the things that has uh, been shown with this year's report is that the number of IGs who reported that their agencies almost always ensure that their contractors uh, provide or uh, the same level of security required by FISMA, OMB policies, and NIST guidelines dropped significantly at the same time that the number of contractor systems increased. So we're having an increasing reliance on contractors where at the same time the oversight of those contractors is declining uh, as uh, in, indicated in these reports. So it's important that as these technologies and services uh, come to the play and, and are being used increasingly by federal agencies, that they do in fact assess the risk of using them and take the appropriate measures to make sure that the security controls are implemented and that the contractors are in fact uh, <coughs> providing the level of security required. Is there any other response? Ms. Patillo. Yes, if I may, Madam Chairwoman, comment on that question. I agree with Mr. Kundra that what we have to do is look toward risk-based systems, especially in our FISMA process. What I would like to add new to that comment is I believe that there has to be an integration with the capital planning process and FISMA. So currently, we sometimes look at that as two separate entities. At the Department of Transportation, we have one of the largest IT budgets in federal government. It's $2.9 billion. Currently, I am spending $125 million on security, which is less than one-half percent on security. So one would ask, is that the appropriate amount of dollars to be spending? Well, we grapple with that from day to day. Is it accurate? Should it be more? Should it be less? Where should we apply it? Should it be toward this certification and accreditation? Or should it be more toward contingency planning? I think with the integration of security and capital planning, we would be able to answer more questions and be able to apply more of a risk-based system. Uh, my time is up, and we'll come back to this uh, in a minute. I'd like now to uh, recognize our ranking member, Mr. Bilbray, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
You know, when I see the, the defensive mechanisms, that's off. That's on. <laughs> okay. It's interesting that two of our mics went out. I know there's. <laughs> <laughs> Like my staff always tells me, you're not paranoid. Everybody really is against you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we've been talking the defensive side. What is the ability for technology to find a electronic fingerprint of those who are probing our systems? None. Very little. Very little. None. The internet was invented um, and developed with the complete assumption that everyone on the internet would be a trusted source. So decades ago when it was actually developed, there was no real concern or thought over someone on the internet will need to be traceable, and number two, would actually have ill intent. So I would guess the, I think the question you're uh, alluding to is attribution. Can we attribute these attacks definitively to a source? I believe the current infrastructure technology is, is no, um, or very difficult. Are we working on technology to be able to track sources? Um, the industry itself is looking at modifying uh, the basic uh, framework of the internet. Very complex issue. There are interoperability issues with older networks and systems, but uh, there are very or various organizations, including the ones that are sponsored by the government, such as DARPA, that are looking into these fundamental issues of how do we change the internet into something more trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And that's a very complex, long-term effort. And I can't speak for everyone at, at Hewlett Packard, but I personally believe this is more of a generational issue than one that can we uh, fix tactically very quickly. I mean, I, I have to assume there are always those that assume that um, eminentity is a great thing, uh, the government, no one should be able to track whatever I do uh, on the Internet, though we take it for granted that we have caller ID with our phones, and, and I'm sure they've got the black helicopter people looking that this is some great conspiracy by Big Brother, but um, I darn well think uh, that it is absurd that we have to play constant defensive ball here and not be able to spend some of those resources at tracking down who's probing, who's plotting, who's trying to find a weak spot. Um, there's no defensive system in the world that can handle constant um, bombardment of those kind of probes without a, you know, a weak link being found somewhere down the line. And, um, I know in the 96, Madam Chair, when I was serving on Energy and Commerce and we were looking at the telecommunication reform, user ID was always a big issue, um, not just for security reasons, but for the, ga you know, the interstate gambling aspect of it, the consumption of alcohol, tobacco, pornography, there was all this stuff. And I, be, I think that we really got to be very frank and, and open about the fact that this user ID is something that needs to be needs to be followed up on, and it may be one of those things that we want to spend more money on being able to track down. God knows every one of us watches CSI and see what we've done with tracking down bad guys electronically. Maybe we need to be looking at some of this, this technology um, in the future. So it really concerns me. What do we have right now as a strategy to go after um, uh, the bad guys who are probing? Or is it the fact that we don't have a way of tracking, so we just accept that we can't do that? So we're actually, um, Department of Homeland Security, and I'll defer to Ms. Graves here, with U.S. CERT, uh, monitors uh, the federal infrastructure to be able to respond accordingly. And on research and development, uh, uh, investments um, are being made, whether it's with the National Science Foundation, whether it's with DARPA, uh, and of course, working closely with the National Security Agency, to look at what the security and the threat matrix is, but you're absolutely right in terms of the nature of the threat. It's constantly evolving as actors go out, as you stand up defense systems, um, making sure that there are actors out there who are also making uh, the, the appropriate investments to be able to penetrate those defense systems. So we have to be ever vigilant, and it cuts across through everything, through the culture of an organization, through human capital, and even the technology systems that are out there. Grace? Yes, to further comment on the U.S. CERT capability, we do have uh, these Einstein sensors that are, are located in the federal government now, and they do have uh, signatures and scripts for people who specifically target the federal government. 
uh, once an intrusion is determined to be active. Uh, we open cases and we do the forensics on those particular cases, scans, and we do track back to the original source. That does take time. Uh, there's not efficient technology to do it, but we do have uh, individuals in place from an intelligence community perspective who deal with these uh, types of threats who aid us in that forensic analysis. And subject to um, uh, future capability, we will also be adding to that in the Department of Homeland Security in terms of, uh, of, of the cybersecurity initiative and uh, plussing up the capability that we have in, in U.S. CERT and also in NPPD. But that's, uh, that's human. Uh, that is the human side of following the threat, of doing the analysis, of determining the source, and of, uh, of looking at counterintelligence measures and reasons why these specific people are targeting the government. Madam Chair, I think this is something that, you know, both sides of the aisle need to be brave enough to address. There are people on the left and the right who would not want this technology, but I, it's not just national security issue, it's security of our children, everybody knows the predator issue, it's sort of sad that, um, you know, we need to have a television show set up sting operations for predators because we don't have the ability to really trace these down. And I'd, I just look forward to the day that we can, you know, we can literally have um, um, some of these probers um, drawn and quartered in, in the public um, square to basically send the signal to everybody, especially our children, that this is not something that is acceptable in a civilized society. Um, uh, though drawn and quartering is. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I yield back. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Is this working? Yeah. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. Yeah. Uh, push the button. <laughs> Is this working? I think you can speak louder. Uh, hopefully, I can be heard nonetheless. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Excuse me, can, we call, can you tell me? I'm outside the microphone. Um, that you, my opening statement also with my cabinet? Yes, sir. <laughs> you didn't capture his? No, I was trying to Okay, it's in writing. Mic. So it's mic here. I got it. Yeah, you want to come over? You can. Here. I'm going to cross the aisle. Why don't you pass this? <laughs> 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 we only do hearings for a living around here. So <laughs> yeah, here, I'll give you this one. Excuse us, you see, we need your technology. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chairman. Madam Chairman. Is that working? Yes, it was. How's that? Here we go. Right. Mm -hmm. Ricardo can hear. Uh, Madam Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent that my um, statement be entered into the record as read. Without objection. Given the fact that it could not be heard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chairman, uh, uh, one of the concerns I've got about this subject is how we're coordinating at the federal government level. And um, I've introduced a bill to try to codify by statute the executive order issued by the President to create a CTO position. Um, the good news is we've got two highly qualified people, Mr. Kundra and Mr. Uh, Anish Chopra, uh, but when we look out to the future, we're not always going to have an Obama administration in place. And I believe very, very strongly that we have to have a statutory framework uh, at, that delineates the respective responsibilities between the two. Um, and I would hope, Mr. Kunder, that you'd take that message back to the White House because uh, we need to work together. Uh, if there are some changes that need to be made in the legislation, fine. But I, I believe, Madam Chairman, we have to address this issue. This committee has to address that issue on a statutory basis. And I certainly intend to proceed with the legislation. I'd like to have White House input in doing that, uh, and I thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Chun, you, you talked in your uh, statement about governance as the first challenge, and you said that we need new and empowered leader to spearhead the effort. What did you have in mind? Uh, someone that's uh, certainly someone that we can go to directly. Uh, for example, if there are issues uh, with some of our contracts, we are almost always going directly um, to a specific person with that agency. And, with, and while that's good, I think as an industry as a whole, we need a, 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 a literally an office we can go to, to for a coordinated effort. Um, we participate in lots of industry activities, BSA, um, which is the Business Software Alliance, uh, Tech America, all those venues. And we, when we talk to our partners, we hear pretty much the same thing from an industry and a, and a, and a cor corporate level. Is there someone that's central to the government that's in charge of this particular issue? Someone that I think uh, would, be, would be valuable to us. So does that answer your question? Um, I think it does, but I think you're talking about on an agency by agency basis. No, I, I meant that as what we do from a business standpoint, but when an industry engages, such as the technology or IT industry engages as a whole, um, it appears to be um, alliances of companies that belong to an organization that deal with a specific agency question or something that, um, that a specific department may issue a question. And until very recently, when the cybersecurity review was being performed, we haven't seen one from a central office in the government that says, we need your input. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a really critical thing that, uh, that's been a positive for us. Good. Well, hopefully the creation of a CTO may help us with that, but I think that's worth monitoring carefully. Um, Mr. Kundra, uh, in your initial review of information security, um, you referred to the FISMA requirements as cumbersome and labor intensive. Uh, I wonder if you could give some examples of how we could improve the process from your point of view. Sure. Part of um, what we need to be able to do is, um, from an OMB perspective, automate a lot of the reporting in terms of collecting of information. Secondly, is we need to be able to rationalize uh, as far as which metrics uh, we're going after, which ones are important, which ones are not. Having thousands of metrics um, doesn't necessarily add value unless those metrics are relevant, those metrics uh, are able to respond to the real-time threat and the nature of the threat that we face and our evolutionary nature in terms of recognizing that as we put up defenses on the other side, there are people putting up offenses. So how do we measure metrics that, or how do we look at and approach security from a position that it has to be one baked into the architecture, whether it's system, agencies, culture, Secondly, how do we make sure that uh, there isn't a model of faceless accountability, that we're all accountable when it comes to information security and the management of those uh, security systems? Third, how do we move towards um, in an area where we're actually monitoring, similar to what U.S. CERT's doing across the board on a real-time basis as threats emerge? So we can see from a leading perspective which threats are emerging across the world so that we can be beneficiaries to, to ensure that we're putting up the proper defenses on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Mr. Wilshusen, um, uh, you know, government often uh, likes to do that which it can measure most easily. Uh, cybersecurity education awareness um, is measurable. You know, we trained 400 people this week. Um, check. The question really is, but are we, in fact, more secure today than since we passed FISMA, with the best of intentions? Uh, and, I, and, and perhaps one can draw the inference from the GAO report that the answer to that is more problematic than we want to admit. Would you comment? Well, I would certainly say you know, I agree with your comment uh, that what gets measured pretty much gets done. And one of the areas that uh, we can do have additional improvements, as Mr. Kundra mentioned, is in the type of measurements and the measures that we actually use to monitor the security uh, at the agencies. As we've commented before, many of the measures that are presently being used are basically compliance-related, implementation measures. They don't measure how effective uh, an agency is actually implementing a control. And, and so that's one of the areas where uh, we need some improvements. And certainly, the measures that are currently being used in, uh, are, in fact, defined by OMB. So Mr. Kundra and OMB are, is in a good position, then, to make changes to that uh, particular uh, mechanism for monitoring security. But indeed, 
Uh, we, the federal agencies have spent a lot of money trying to secure their systems and complying with various different requirements. Uh, and it's still very much an open question whether we are more secure. Uh, I would say that with the evolving threats uh, and, and with the, the new emerging technologies that are in place as well as uh, the changing business practices, they all increase risk to federal systems and operations. And it's a very fluid, dynamic environment that we have to address on a regular, real-time basis. Madam Chairman, uh, I'm sure my time is up, but uh, I want to suggest that uh, we may want to invite our, our federal witnesses to uh, uh, to provide the committee, the subcommittee, with their recommendations for how we might improve FISMA toward the goal of ensuring cybersecurity. I am far less concerned about how many people we train in you know, in awareness, though that's important. Uh, but the goal isn't edu isn't awareness. That's that's part of the process. The goal is to ensure the security of the system. And, and frankly, Madam Chairman, I'm, I'm so glad you're having this, this hearing because, frankly, if people really looked at the potential threat, we'd have to have this hearing in the Cannon Caucus Room uh, in terms of its importance. Um, and um, mm -hmm. I want to thank you again for holding this hearing because I, I can't think of a topic that's more timely and more important uh, as we look out to the future. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, the GAO reports that many of the government data losses were a result of physical thefts or improper safeguarding the systems, including laptops and other portable devices. And I recall the well-publicized uh, event several years ago of a computer that was stolen from the Veterans Affairs employee with a massive amount of personal data of uh, the VA beneficiary. And how many of the reported security incidents are considered physical breaches as opposed to data that is lost or corrupted through cyber means? And what additional security vulnerabilities do cell phones and Blackberries and other wireless devices present to securing sensitive or classified information? And. Uh, well, I'll start off, if you don't mind, Madam Chairwoman. Okay. Uh, with regard to the actual number of incidents that have been attributed to physical uh, uh, security lapses, such as theft or loss of laptops, I don't have that specific information. The information that is presented in the agency's report to the U.S. CERT has shown that the number of total incidents have tripled over the last two years, from 06 through 08. And of that, uh, the physical security portion of that would be one of the categories that's included in the unauthorized access category that uh, U.S. CERT requires agencies to report under. And, and of that, there was about 18 percent of the number of incidents that occurred, and that tripled right, from 5,500 in 06 to over 16,000 in 08. About 18 percent of those related to unauthorized access to information. And that would include both uh, cyber access where someone came in through a network and, and was able to access information as well as those uh, pertaining to the loss or theft of, of a laptop or some other physical means. Uh, but certainly that is a key uh, control threat and vulnerability of federal systems is the fact that so much of the federal workforce is mobile. The data is becoming increasingly portable through not just on laptop computers, but also thumb drives. And it's important that appropriate security measures, such as encryption and other capabilities, are installed to help mitigate the threat of such uh, incidents occurring whereby they are stolen. And we us. mitigate those threats. We can certainly try to address them and take appropriate controls to help reduce the risk associated with those threats. You know, and I guess it's also important to realize that risk avoidance is, a, is not even a goal in, with related to cybersecurity. It's managing the risk. Mm -hmm. So we have to assess the risk with the information. First of all, as Mr. Kundra mentioned earlier, is assess, is this information sensitive and from what purpose, from a confidentiality perspective or integrity? And then if it's not sensitive from a confidentiality perspective, then you know the level of controls might be less than if it's 
sensitive information, and then we may want to use encryption. For example, with personally identifiable information, OMB has issued policies in the past requiring that agencies that put sensitive information on their laptops be encrypted and that the life of that information on that laptop or of that information on that laptop be limited to uh, 90 days and then it should be reevaluated whether that information should continue to reside on that laptop. So there are controls that could be in place and, and in fact are in place at, at some agencies, but uh, they probably need to be in, implemented on a more regular basis. You know, how can we harmonize across these agencies? Uh, what I see is that each agency f has different standards. And so some way we need to coordinate and harmonize. How can we do that? And anyone might. Mr. Shore. Madam Chairman, I think, you know, you're, you're touching on something that, that I commented on in both my oral and written testimony. And I think that what you're, if I can try and distill what you're saying in, into my own words, the technology exists to address the various issues and threats that you're speaking about. But what often gets lost in these discussions is that the human being, you and I, are still despite all the technology, we are still the last line of defense. And I see this in the private sector as well as the public. And, and the bottom line is we feel very strongly that it is only through a level beyond awareness training, as you pointed out. The awareness training is wonderful, but it is, it is documented to be insufficient. We need to be pushing training down from the IT staffer level throughout the agencies to ensure that those who have access to this sensitive information are clearly trained and certified in their ability to have access to it and use it. I'll yield to Mr. Bilberg. Let me um, follow up on a different um, line here. The discussion of bringing in uh, basically an IT security expert into the White House, you know, Will that help coordinate the efforts, or will that um, basically just add another layer? So, so that's been uh, part of actually the 60-day review, um, working with Melissa Hathaway, looking at how we're organized across the board um, within the federal government. At the same time, we recognize that cybersecurity is such a vital issue, and it cuts across every aspect of life uh, when it comes to the federal government that we need to ensure that we have the proper attention and the president's recommend, uh, the recommendations are gonna be forthcoming in terms of the 60 day review, in terms of what we need to do to ensure that we're organized in a way that allows us to respond to these evolving threats. And if I may add, uh, Ranking Member Bill Bray, uh, GAO convened a panel of cybersecurity experts uh, a couple months ago to look at that very same issue and to provide recommendations or suggestions for improvement into the national cybersecurity strategy. And they suggested that uh, indeed establishing White House responsibility and accountability for leading and overseeing national cybersecurity policy is very important. One of the problems uh, that has occurred to date in this space is that much of that responsibility had been given to DHS in its role. But for a number of different reasons, including uh, turnover, key personnel, and the fact that they didn't have accountability or authority to monitor budgets or anything like that, that they were, they had limited effectiveness in, in performing that role. So elevating it up to the White House was one of the issues that uh, our panel of cybersecurity experts thought was needed in this respect. So you do support? Yes. What does that do in the, um, in the oversight uh, jurisdiction of this committee and the other com committees in the, in the House and Senate? I don't know what the uh, specific impact would be by elevating that with regard to the oversight of this committee. Okay. Well, I got you here. Um, you know, there was testimony here about uh, the DOD's uh, directive in um, the initiative to ensure and require certification. Um, do you think this is a pro program that we should use as a model, or is there you see major um, major um, shortfalls here with our shortcomings of the the, um, the concept, or 
do you think you've got we've got operational systems that are um, just as good I think anytime you can improve the skills knowledge and abilities of those individuals responsible for implementing security is a benefit the key as has been mentioned earlier that the fact of providing computer security awareness training while that's fine it still gets to the point of how effective is that training and how will we know whether or not individuals responsible for sec implementing security actually act appropriately in the time of need when they are being challenged and that's why having measures as the number of personnel that might be certified and accredited or I'm sorry certified or that have received computer security awareness training may be somewhat misleading. What would probably be a better measure is to have some sort of a challenge response test to see how they react when uh, uh, an incident occurs. And just as an example, the Internal Revenue Service has a pretty good program of where the IG would actually ask specific questions to their claims uh, representatives over the phone about a tax question and then they could then determine how accurate those responses were and whether or not they were getting uh, accurate tax information <laughs> in response. My family's been in the tax business since the year I was born and believe me it's so. Uh, it, it, and what they typically find is that many of the responses they receive from their uh, tax representatives are wrong and, and incorrect. Why can't we design similar tests uh, for cybersecurity. Why can't we send perhaps an email to an individual to see how many of them actually open up the attachment or uh, click on a link? We don't do testing systems right now. I mean, like a good example. We test systems. I don't know if we test the for the effectiveness of those systems across the board. Certainly, we don't do that as part of the FISMA reporting process. Yeah, I mean, I, Madam Chair, you remember probably something we need to talk about too is they just did a test to see about getting uh, passports by phony IDs and four out of four, bam, right through. And that's a whole different issue. Uh, can I really get, after the mics have been all, um, you know, messed up all day, I'm, uh, I'm in a paranoid sense here, but how do we know that the people we're hiring aren't working for the bad guys? What kind of security does DOD do when you bring people on? How do we know? Do we use biometrics? Do we do background checks? Do, how do we know when you know, the bad guys aren't slipping into the system and actually programming our system? Well, uh, Ranking Member Bill Ray, I can't speak specifically to that, but I can certainly find the answer for you. But I can tell you that in, in, some, of the, um, in some of the private sector equivalents that CompTIA is involved in, and CompTIA was intimately involved in the 8570 directive, those controls are there. Background checks are a critical piece of that. Um, of that accreditation. So those controls are there. And I think to your earlier question about um, the type of testing that goes on, there is a testing component to 8570. But again, I will have someone get back to you in writing with the specifics on exactly how far that goes so that you know how applicable that model may be to the rest of the government. We think it's very applicable. Now, right now, employees are all go through at least E-Verify, just to make sure their Social Security number and their name matches, right? I would think at a minimum. I, okay, and the, um, uh, but the contractors, the administration has, the previous administration and this administration has delayed the E-Verify requirement for contractors generically from February, now we're late June, hopefully we'll see it go. But um, uh, the fact is, is that right now in, in the IT system, do we use that on contractors who are brought in to do, do work? Well, one of the interesting- Everything's in-house? One of the interesting things you might want to, to investigate is, and, and without getting too far off track, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as you may know, has passed some fairly sweeping privacy, information security privacy regulations. And part of that is certifying that the third party vendors that are hired, now this is focused mostly at private sector, but, but again, I think ultimately there's a, there's a tremendous opportunity for a public-private partnership here in sort of establishing these standards that will work throughout the federal system as well as the private sector. But you will have to, you know, for example, as, as a very simplistic example, you mentioned tax work. So if you are a CPA firm and you engage a company like my own, AVAR, 
to work with your information systems, we have got to provide that safe harbor information that certifies we have done all the things you're talking about so that that organization knows that the contractors they're bringing in meet these various stringent requirements. I think something similar at the federal level makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. Uh, Senator Rockefeller and Snow recently introduced legislation that included provisions to establish a cybersecurity office in the White House, along with federal acquisition and procurement requirements for IT. And I'd welcome, in writing, uh, your comments on what should go in to the legislation. Uh, is it out yet? Can we see the legislation? The draft, the draft. Yeah. Yeah, there's a draft out now, and but you just might want to suggest what should be included in that legislation. Uh, several members have mentioned uh, we'll probably need some kind of policy to deal with this. So I'd like to have your input as well. Now, moving on, uh, the GAO reported that 23 of the 24 major agencies <coughs> for fiscal year 2008 did not identify or authenticate users in order to prevent unauthorized access to agency networks. Uh, authenticating users appears to be a fundamental security breach at the front end that can have a cascading effect on security breaches throughout the system. And I know uh, you, Mr. Bilbray, uh, raised this issue during our last hearing. And uh, do we know who is authorized to have access and who is legitimate and who is not? And um, why have the vast majority of agencies failed to create adequate security measures to identify and authenticate users? And uh, this question has been, I guess, raised but I'd, have, I'd like to hear further comment from you on why it's taking so long to do this. Jen? Um, I believe the agencies that have complied, uh, the ones, that, uh, the ones that, uh, that come to mind is the Defense Department in our Navy Marine Corps internet contract. Uh, we well, it says to, the GAO said 23 of the 24 major agencies did not identify um, there are agencies, what I was uh, alluding to is trying to demonstrate a success story. Um, in the, in, for the Navy Marine Corps internet contract, we were one of the first to implement a cryptogra cryptographic logon mandate, which basically says you need to use multi-factor authentication. Use who you are, what you have, instead of just typing a user and password in. The technology does exist. Um, it has been implemented. It has been successful in other places. I can't speak for the exact specific reason why an agency would choose or hasn't gotten to that, but it is relatively mature. Matter of fact, it just doesn't necessarily need to be two. There could be as many authentication factors uh, to gain access to a system. But you do have to balance, and it's always the kind of the sensitive thing about security is uh, the safest computer in the world is one that's not connected to the Internet in a steel bunker with no windows and no doors. And you can put so many, <laughs> you, you can put so many controls into a system that it's actually not providing any value to the mission of the agency. So it is one of those things that we try to be particular on. That's one that the technology does exist. Uh, it is mature, we believe, and it has been used in the past, so we encourage uh, all the agents to use it. Yes, Mr. Bilberg. Yeah, the, uh, do we, uh, does the DOD now use any biometrics to confirm on this, or is it all strictly um, just on data information? The, the, I can get you the specific technical details in written form, but the, the, uh, the common access cards they use, it is capable of, of storing biometric information. Um, whether that's used specifically, I'll have to get back to you on across the DOD, on uh, maybe actually a better question for the, the Defense Department, but we know in our, um, you know what, matter of fact, I believe they do use biometrics on their, on their CAT cards. And I only bring that up, Madam Chair, I don't know if you use the clear system when you fly back and forth from Los Angeles, but there's, there's a system that has multiple checks, so it rotates and up around, and, and it's probably going to, in a lot of ways, be the, the, the sort of flagship of indication of what is possible with a whole lot of these issues, and I yield back, Madam Chair. And Madam Chairwoman, if I might just clarify yes. one point, is what we found is that 23 out of the 24 agencies did not sufficiently implement controls to effectively prevent, limit, 
or detect unauthorized access to uh, systems. And so it's a little bit broader than just identification and authentication controls, but it also includes weaknesses related to uh, boundary protection, you know, making sure that the firewalls and routers are adequately configured, uh, as well as uh, the authorization controls, which uh, assure that agencies only grant the level of access to an individual necessary to perform that individual's job and no more. It also includes their procedures for uh, auditing and monitoring access to networks to look for, uh, for looking for intrusions and the audit and logging mon uh, or audit and logging capabilities, as well as physical security to uh, computing resources. So it's a little bit broader than just those controls used to identify and authenticate the identity of users. We hear from these agencies that it's under review. Is it that we're short-staffed or the expertise needs to be increased, or do we lack the resources, financial resources, to speed up Yeah, process? I think it's probably... Uh, All the above? Probably so. You know, one of the things that's important to understand is that many of these capabilities already reside in the systems at hand that are in use. And so it's important upon agencies to actually implement and configure the systems accordingly to provide the level of uh, security that's required for, to protect their information and systems. Do you feel it's the lack of oversight from the policy makers? Are, there's new technology being developed every single day and getting a handle on how we secure it to reduce the risk and the vulnerabilities of that system is mind-boggling. And anyone who wants to comment, please do. Because we're trying to, what we're going to do as a subcommittee is provide information from the testimony that we have up to the full committee for policy. And so just break in at any time because we want to get this right from the beginning if that's possible. Um, if I Ms. can Matilla. add to that, oh, sorry. I saw you looking like you wanted to speak. Yes, Madam Chairwoman, I would like to comment on that. At the Department of Transportation, we look at the amount of events that are captured through our Cybersecurity Management Center. And when we look at those, it is mind-boggling if you would realize that there are three million events that come in on a given day. Of those three million events, we have to analyze those into actionable events. What we typically come up with at the end of the day out of those three million is 10 actionable events. So there, are hu there is human intervention among analyzing that. So if one could just try to visualize individuals that are having to correlate this data to figure out which are really actionable events, we find that what I believe, as Mr. Kundra has said, we have to look more to automation and the technology. Because if you're looking solely to human intervention to analyze what this means that comes in to our networks on a given day, wouldn't it be simpler if we had an automated way of determining which events are actual incidents? If I could add to that, um, it's also looking at the default setting of products and services that the federal government procure, procures. Uh, because from a con uh, commercial perspective, what a lot of the providers want to do is they want to have maximum functionality and they want to make available as many options as possible. Unfortunately, a lot of those options end up uh, causing vulnerabilities in the systems themselves. So if we think of it on the front end, in terms of making sure that the default position uh, when it comes to whether it's systems, the way they're configured, um, or it's services that we're uh, uh, acquiring are as secure as possible, and then one by one, based on the options we need, we turn them on, I think it moves the security agenda much further forward. Uh, I want to go back to you, Ms. Patilio. You have all these actionable items uh, what would you suggest that we put into policy that will help? 
since you have these incidents a uh, hundred times a day, what would you suggest that we do policy-wise that will assist you? Okay, from a policy perspective, what would uh, assist us, I believe, as Mr. Kundra has already articulated, we need to look at the very beginning of the process, which begins with procurement. At the onset, all contracts should be required to have security baked in at the very beginning. Should we do that through policy, or can you do that within your own department? We could do that as a requirement. We could do that within our own departments, but I believe get that it gives it an extra sense of authority if perhaps we could have it written in the FAR. Okay. Mr. Kundu, did you want to address that? I, I, sorry. Mr. Shun. I think we, uh, as a large system integrator, have seen some advances in the acquisition process. I believe, um, I can double check this, that is actually written into the federal ac acquisition regulations, specific sections about security that hasn't, wasn't there before. And we're also seeing a lot more security as a requirement and clearly articulated requirement in acquisitions that we respond to. So I think there's some very um, positive steps forward. I'm not entirely convinced or sure whether at a policy level um, how that interacts with actual tactical acquisitions that go out, but certainly it's something that, I, you know, it's being done, we support it, especially if it's very clearly articulated so that we can meet them. But at a policy standpoint, I just don't see how that would be connected from at a policy level other than you need to make this, you know, and acquire it this way. Does that make sense? Somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> and we ourselves are trying to reach for, you know, solutions to mitigate some of these issues. And so we expect you as the experts to suggest to us. So really what I'd like you to do, uh, we're going to be addressing these areas that we have uh, been focusing on today put in writing your recommendations, and we'll see what we really need to add to what's already in the law. And uh, if we can improve it, we will. So just feel free to recommend to us. Mr. Will Schultz. Yes, one thing I might add, and it's uh, expanding what Mr. Kundra said, is one of the areas that we should probably look at is instead of looking at acquisitions on a department by a department level, is looking at it on a government-wide basis because the, I, the federal government spends billions of dollars, I think it's what, $70 billion in IT uh, products and services for uh, this fiscal year, is to leverage the procurement power of the federal government collectively to achieve both cost savings and to help incentivize uh, 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 the vendors and the producers of, of the software to provide more secure products. There are a couple of initiatives already underway through Smart Buy that GSA has, which helps to allow agencies to buy encrypted products at reduced rates and at cost savings, as well as the federal desktop core configuration, which uh, Mr. Kundra alluded to, in terms of having eight or the vendors provide security or provide uh, products with our security already built into it. Thank you. Uh, we're going to conclude this, but I'd like Mr. Bilbray to Yeah, let me follow up on that. Follow um, up. Madam Chair, um, the conversation just really went to, um, you know, the, the roadmap of where we need to go down the line. Those of us in California, you know, the six years I served on the Air Resources Board there, there was a thing called technology forcing regulation that created the cleanest fuel, the cleanest cars, and uh, really pushed it. But one of the things I'm really upset about what I'm seeing coming out of energy and commerce right now is, or what was announced today of a standard that the federal government was going to set for everybody else, but not using our procurement resources as a way of leading through example. Uh, I think that a lot of us it, on both sides of the aisle feel if the federal government had led through example of buying clean fuel, clean energy for this facility, going out and buying uh, high efficiency vehicles or ordering a massive amounts over a period of years, that that would create the, um, the incentive and the market for the research development for the kind of product we want to see. And um, uh, we've been able to do that in California by setting goals that were over the horizon but within the realm of reality 
and the private sector because of the profit uh, uh, incentive has been able to develop technologies um, that we desire to possess somewhere within the near future. So I guess the issue here is the federal government can lead through example by using those huge resources to be able to develop that. Um, and then the spinoff goes over to the private sector where they then can benefit from that, from that te technological breakthrough. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to have to conclude uh, this hearing. We do have a vote up. I want to thank the witnesses uh, for your testimony today. We consider you the experts. And so, as I suggested before, as I suggested before, uh, we would appreciate you uh, writing your recommendations. We will continue down this road because we have the responsibility of looking at procurement policies. And so this is a work in process, and we are going to try to refine it each time we have a hearing. We don't know it all, and we haven't heard it all. But uh, I think this hearing was very valuable. I hope the recorder was able to get everything down because there's been a lot of good information offered. We will see next time we hold a hearing that our systems work. Mm -hmm. But with that, <laughs> I want to thank uh, you for attending your testimony, the audience, for being good listeners, and uh, the ranking member, Mr. Bilbrey, for your insights. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. I just think they were your first wishes. Yes. That's good. I like this one. We don't need to. We're worried about what other people are doing. I'll tell you one thing. We have some very strong opinions, and we'll be doing some good stuff. Good job. How are you? Good job. Thanks. And you got some kudos, kudos too. It doesn't always happen. <laughs>
Vietnam who said they saw a UFO or two. You think maybe they did drugs? Well, after seeing something like that, who could blame them? Gregory! Hello, dear. What brings you by? Oh, uh, probably nothing. Maybe something. Maybe something big. Well, I wish you luck with that. What's that, a rose? Oh, this, yes. Well, it's the most delightful thing. I had uh, lunch with Teensy at that little French place. And you know that charming valet. The one who always remembers my name. Yeah. Uh, he left this on the passenger seat. Well, don't you think that's uh, a little inappropriate? Edward, are you jealous? No. What would I do with a flower? Oh, you are jealous. No, it's not right. You're a man's wife. Yes, I am. Now, I'm going up to my bedroom. Why don't you slip into something a little more comfortable and um, join me? Absolutely. Uh, just to save us both a little embarrassment, this is about sex, right? <laughs> OK, one used cash register, 50 bucks. Pete, you are a lifesaver. Larry broke the other one trying to find the bell. <laughs> Did you know that Richard Nixon enlisted Elvis as a consultant on the fake moon landing and part of it was filmed at Graceland? Yeah, I heard that. Okay, uh, let me tell you a couple things about this. It doesn't have numbers per se, so here's what you gotta do. Say you got a book that's like six dollars, you wanna hit quarter pounder, quarter pounder. <laughs> that's not quite enough, so you, you wanna go large fry and that'll bring you right in the ballpark here. Great. Dharma, your belief in UFOs is not your fault. I've done some research and I think I've stumbled on an organized conspiracy of individuals suppressing the truth about UFOs for their own financial gain. Yep, we're all getting rich. That's how we can afford these fancy lives. You know, I dated a girl who was abducted by a UFO. You did not. All right. She wasn't a girl. She was pushing 60, but <laughs> let me tell you, my friend, those aliens, they taught her a few tricks. Yes, this makes sense. A superior race travels millions of miles to teach our women how to have sex. Take a look at these things, Greg. They're not lookers. <laughs> they better have some skills. <laughs> look at this. We live in a culture of irrationality and conclusion jumping. Yeah, hang on, honey. Where is our grand opening ad? I took it down there myself. They said we were going to be right between the futons and the colonic irrigation. Uh, excuse me. Fire inspection. Oh, OK. Uh, yes, hi. I'm calling about an ad I placed yesterday. Let me ask you a question. Does this look like a UFO to you? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, ba based on your own observation or on a predisposition caused by images you've seen in the media. Oh. Uh. Yeah, I guess I see your point. See, it's easy if I explain it to you one-on-one, -on -one, but the trick is to explain it to a brainwashed public at large. Yeah, I bet that's the trick, all right. <laughs> Excuse me. That's strange. They said Mr. Finkelstein called and canceled the ad. That doesn't make any sense. We open tomorrow. No, you don't. What? Call us when you move that bookcase out of the doorway, and we'll re-inspect. Well, it's always been there. Can you believe this guy? Why did Larry cancel the ad? Maybe he didn't. Maybe you were given false information. <laughs> it happens. No, the woman said she personally spoke to a Mr. Finkelstein. But she didn't say Larry. Why would Uncle Herb cancel the ad? So the store would fail. But he put up the money. Yeah. And why? Look at this place. <laughs> I mean, Larry always claims that Uncle Herb always wants everyone to know that he's the big success and that Larry is the failure. Maybe there's something to that. I mean, who's the one who noticed the bookcase and all of a sudden the fire inspector shows up? If the store never opens, Larry looks like a loser and Uncle Herb comes out scot-free just like the guys who faked the moon landing. <laughs> See, honey, this is the problem with you believing in UFOs. It makes stuff like this almost sound like it makes sense. Oh, I'm sorry I haven't seen more of you, little guy. He's a beautiful boy, Larry. I know. And look at that head of hair. <laughs> Don't get too attached to a little fella. Word of the truth. I don't know how you did it, Dharma, but it sure is great to see Herb and Larry getting along so well. Yeah. Maybe I didn't do such a good thing here. Why, is something wrong? Wow. I might 
have conspiracies on the brain here, but I think Uncle Herb is trying to sabotage the store. Tell me that's completely crazy. I wish I could, sweetie. What? Well, Herb's always been kind of jealous of Larry. You know, of his lifestyle and his accomplishments and his analytical <laughs> mind. And plus, he never quite got over the fact that I chose Larry over him. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. I dated her first. But we were at this party one night, and I saw your father across the room. You know, he was wearing one of those fringe jackets, and he was spinning around and around. <laughs> I thought he was dancing, but he was just trying to get his arm into his sleeve. <sighs> he needed me. And I've been there ever since. Herb was pretty upset. Well, he didn't say anything, but when Larry took me home, he tried to run us off the road twice. <laughs> Let's serve the carrot cake. Does your mouthwash work in six different ways? Introducing Listerine Total Care. Everything you need to strengthen teeth, help prevent cavities, and kill germs. Introducing 6-in-1 Listerine Total Care, the most complete mouthwash. Thank your lucky stars. It's Macy's Memorial Day sale. Get 25 to 50% savings store-wide. Plus, save an extra 15% when you use your savings pass or Macy's Star Rewards card. Macy's Memorial Day sale starts tomorrow. For me? Your favorite toy? I, I couldn't. You're going to want Mr. Fuzzy Man even more now that we've discovered Beneful Playful Life with real wholesome ingredients like beef, egg, and even oatmeal. <gasps> Extra protein for strong muscles. So you're ready for anything. You think you're getting spoiled, but it's so good for you, too. Beneful Playful Life. Another healthful, flavorful Beneful. Why this diet? Why this diet? Why this diet? 15,000 15, doctors, that's why. My brother Steve uh, lives in Tennessee. He is uh, the first person I put on this program. I love my brother dearly, but he hadn't taken the best care of himself. He told me about some of the programs he'd been on, and I didn't, I didn't know half of them. There were so many of them. I said, Steve, I can help you. There's this incredible program called Take Shape for Life. Use Metafast Replacement Meals, five-in-one plan. I'll be your health coach. Try it. What do you have to lose? He lost 50 pounds in about three months. He feels terrific. He looks wonderful. He is, he is thrilled, and I'm thrilled because I was able to help someone who I love dearly. Developed by a doctor, Metafast meals are scientifically formulated with an optimal protein, carb, and fiber combination. This scientific combination produces a fat-burning state with faster weight loss, increased energy, and less hunger costing about $5 less per day than what the average American spends on food, Metafast saves you real money. Call now for your free two-week offer. I have one lady that never knew about Metafast. She had lost 40 pounds and needed to lose 40 more and could not get it off. She was trying everything. She finally called me, she said, look, I can't get this 40 pounds off. I'm gonna try your program. I said, great, okay. Two weeks into the program, 10 pounds are off. She was only losing a half a pound a week with other programs. Now they can do it. Now they see hope. Now they're like, wow, this is really gonna happen for me. Make it happen for you. Get two free weeks of Metafast by calling 1-800-692-1057. 1-800-692-1057. When you're on a diet, hungry always seems to get in the way. That's why Weight Watchers created the brand new Momentum program. Now you can conquer hungry and other things that stop you from losing weight. Call 1-800-310-8833 now. Learn new strategies like choosing filling foods so you don't eat when you're tempted or bored. So you can lose weight and keep it off. Call 1-800-310-8833. Or go to weightwatchers.com slash momentum. Show hungry who's boss.
Join now. Get free registration. Hurry in. Offer ends June 6th. Call 1-800-310-8833. Weight Watchers. Stop dieting. Start living. Unforgettable. That's what you are.